Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, daily devotion time. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, yesterday, I had uh, asked you to pray about these uh, coronavirus and Christ books that uh, still have not arrived. And uh, I'm sad to say this morning they haven't arrived yet. So uh, we're really hoping for today. So I'd ask you to continue to, uh, to be in prayer uh, for this. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And our main focus will be verses 6 and 7. And this is a very, very well-known passage. Probably many, many of you have memorized these verses before. Um, so I just want to direct your attention there. But as you're turning there to Philippians 4, um, I also want to uh, say that um, I was reading a, a CBC News report uh, early this morning. And apparently uh, our Premier, uh, Mr. Ford, is going to be making an announcement today. Um, later in the day, probably around 1 o'clock, I think the announcement comes, or 11 o'clock sometime later in the day, um, just about uh, the phase one of reopening Ontario for business and, and other things. And I was encouraged by one particular thing that was said. Um, it was, uh, this was a draft, um, but what they said was that the government is preparing, I'm reading this, the government is preparing for the next steps of reopening by consulting with faith communities and the wedding industry to develop guidance that may enable safe gatherings for wedding ceremonies and religious occasions. And the reason why that was such an encouragement to me was we haven't heard anything up to this point in time about what the government is thinking concerning churches, synagogues, mosques, other places of worship. So the fact that this is mentioned uh, today uh, or last night as the news report came out it gives some excitement to me, and I hope it does to you too, that we should be hearing soon uh, about what the government uh, is planning uh, so that we can regather again. It's not something to be in prayer about for sure. Our action committee, the ministry committee, the uh, elders are considering um, our next steps. And what does reopening look like for us? So that's something we should be uh, really praying about. And then, of course, as I mentioned to you, I think every day this week, uh, tomorrow uh, is COVID blessing time. So Andrea will be joining me and we'll focus in on uh, many of the things that you are going to share with us. We've received quite a few emails up to this point in time. But if you are planning to let us know what your COVID blessings are, uh, please do so within the next couple of hours because uh, we'll be working on that later today. And we'd like to incorporate... Uh, much of what you send to us uh, into uh, the things that we will share with you tomorrow morning. So let's pray. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit for his help. Our God and Father, we are grateful to you for this new day that you have given to us, and we want to commit it again to you by beginning it with prayer, uh, beginning this day with reading your word to seek uh, and to receive from you uh, our daily bread. And so we pray you will provide for us, and we pray that the Holy Spirit and his help will be available to us so that what we read can be applied appropriately to our hearts. Lord, this is a great passage, and I pray that you will just make it come alive in our hearing and understanding today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read uh, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, but I want you to take particular notice of verses 6 and 7, because that is where our focus is going to be. So Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness or reasonableness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition or prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Okay, um, this morning... Um, this morning I'm going to give to you a little bit of a confession uh, about the impact of these verses on my heart. Um, and I'm not talking about the impact they've had on me over the years, but uh, the impact, uh, frankly, of the last 24 hours, probably even less than that, the last 12 hours. And, um, and I'll share about that in just a few, a few minutes. But I want to just talk first of all, about worry or anxiety, because that's what this passage is saying. Don't be anxious about anything. Verse 6, don't worry about anything. So the word worry we use a lot, and uh, we, we use it in a lot of different ways. We talk about people who are worry warts. Uh, we talk about people who are always worrying about things. Everybody worries in one way or another, but let's define what what worry really is, what anxiety really is. To worry uh, actually means to be pulled in different directions. That's the meaning of the word. See, there, there, are, there are two things at work in us that cause worry. The first is our hope. Um, and our hope pulls us in one direction. But then there are our fears, and those fears pull us in another direct, direct direction. So we want to go one way. This is our hope. We're, we're anticipating that this is what is going to happen, and we're excited about that. But then we're overcome with all these fears that our hope will not be realized. That, in essence, is what worry is. It's hope and fear being pulled in two different directions. The old English word for worry means to strangle Think about that. When, you, when someone strangles someone, they're actually cutting off their oxygen. They're attempting to kill them so that they can't breathe. And that's really what worry is. It's, it's something that strangles us. It pulls us in different directions, but at the same time, it strangles us. So just imagine uh, a rope around your neck. One end of the rope is called hope, and the other end of the rope is fear. And they're pulling in both directions, and the result is the cutting off of your oxygen. It, strang it strangles you. So immediately we know, just from the, the word worry itself, that worry um, has physical consequences. And um, I was reading last, last night. I'm going to start to talk a little bit about my confession and experience. But last night I was reading about worry. And um, the author was talking about what worry can actually do. And he mentioned, he mentioned four things. Headaches, ulcers, neck pains, and back pains. So, so worrying then affects our thinking, headaches. It affects our digestion, ulcers, or an upset stomach. It can affect our coordination, neck and back pains. Now, interestingly, in this passage, when we try to define what worry is in a biblical sense, we get some hints in verse, in verse 7, that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. So we're talking about the mind and we're talking about the heart. And when you think about it, that's what worry does. Worry affects the way we think. Or worry is a wrong way of thinking, is probably a better way to put it. And worry is a wrong way to feel. It affects our emotions. Our emotions are deeply disturbed when worry happens. So again, our emotions are really tied in very closely with the way that we think. Worry is wrong thinking, and worry, according to the Bible, is wrong feeling. Now, when we think of worry and what the Bible says about it, there are probably two passages in God's Word which, um, which say the most about it, or they really stand out as being dominant passages in God's Word about worry. The first is in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, 
where Jesus t tells us not to worry about our lives, what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear. In other words, worry pertains to the basic necessities of life, those things that we need to live. And Jesus said, don't worry about those things. Um, who of you could, can, can add a, a single moment to his life by worrying? He tells us to look at the birds. He tells us to look at the the, uh, uh, the flowers in the fields. And he says, God cares for all of these. And of course, that passage ends with verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. That is, all the basic necessities of life will be given to you. So Jesus tells us to think in a different way. He tells us to pursue a different thing. Not to pursue the necessities of life but to pursue the kingdom of God. And if we do, then the necessities of life will be added to us. The second passage in God's word that deals with worry is this passage right here. This is the passage that really stands out, verses six and seven. Now in the context of verse six and seven, um, we, we see here that worry does a couple of things to us. First of all, it robs us of our joy. And, I think that's what Paul is alluding to in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. If you worry, you're losing your joy. Worry is a joy robber. Second thing, verse 5, let your reasonableness or gentleness be evident to all. When you worry, you lose your reasonableness. You lose your gentleness. You're upset, you're anxious, and so it begins to rub off on other people. And generally... People who are worried are not reasonable. They're not gentle. And the third thing is right there also in verse 4. The Lord is near. Worry robs us of our sense of the presence of God. It, 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 it robs us of experiencing God's presence. And so that's why prayer, of course, is so important. Do not be anxious, verse 6, about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So the solution is prayer. The solution is prayer. So we're going to talk about prayer today. When the Bible talks about prayer, uh, the Bible uses a number of different words to describe prayer. Three of those words are actually found in verses 6 and 7. There's a fourth word that isn't, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But there are four basic words that describe prayer. The first is the word prayer itself. And the word prayer is sort of a, a label or an overarching title that is given to all of the various kinds of praying or the different words that pertain to prayer. It is the general word for going into God's presence. And the word prayer, when it says here, um, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, the idea there is prayer is adoration, it is devotion, it is worship. Whenever you go to prayer, there, prayer means to adore God. It means to worship God. And so the first idea about praying is to worship God. The key word, adoration. So when worry comes, when concerns overwhelm us, the first step that that we should undertake is to focus our eyes on God. That essentially is what prayer is, focusing our eyes on God. So we're focusing on God before we ask him for anything. We focus on him. We begin to adore him. We begin to recount, as it were, in our minds, in our thinking, in what we say to God, just how great God is. We, we, we talk about his attributes, we talk about his character, we talk about his bigness, that he is the Lord God Almighty, that nothing is impossible with God. So we need to refocus our eyes on God. We need to see his bigness, that he is bigger than any problem that we might be experiencing that causes us worry. So I'm thinking now of Psalm 27 again, which is my favorite psalm. One thing I have desired of the Lord, David says, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze, there's that word, prayer, 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to adore him first. Then he adds, and to inquire in his temple. There's the petitioning part of prayer. So we see that even in Psalm 27, these two things are there. So we need to, instead of rushing into God's presence, here's what I'm really saying. And I think this is what verse six is saying. Instead of rushing into God's presence and just immediately spilling to God all the things that worry us, all the needs that we have, we need to adore God. We need to focus on God because that reorients everything in us so that we're thinking about how big God is. And then when we bring our request to him, we know that he's, that he's got it. It isn't just the frantic spilling of, of stuff to God. It is an adoration of the Lord. So we need to adore him first. That's what the word prayer means. The second word is supplication. And it's found here, actually, in Philippians 4, uh, not in the New International Version. The New International Version uses the word petition, but it's just another way of, of translating what, what the Greek is saying by, by prayer and by petition, by prayer and supplication. So other translations will use the word supplication. Now, supplication is an old word, and you hardly hear it used today. And because the New International Version is a more modern translation, the translators have chosen the word petition instead. But petition or supplication simply means to plead, to plead humbly. And I think the key word here would be earnest. It's an earnest pleading before God. There's, there's some intensity to it. Uh, it's an earnest sharing of the needs and the problems that we have. So the key word here is earnest pleading. And it's always a pleading before God about our personal needs, about our personal needs. Not praying for others. It's praying about ourselves and our own needs. So there's things that worry us, concerns that we have. Supplicating is bringing those things to God. Now, interestingly, in the book of Hebrews, um, there's mention made of Jesus and that Jesus practiced this in his own praying. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions or prayers and supplications. So he was adoring God and supplicating before God. And he did this with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. So on many occasions, Jesus supplicated before God. We see that when he was in the, uh, uh, the garden. Uh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That was supplication, praying about himself, casting onto God all of the petitions that he, that he had. That's supplication. Now, the next word for prayer or category of praying is the word intercession. And that's the word that is not found here in Philippians 4. And um, intercession simply means to pray on behalf of others. So for example, if you, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul urges us, and he uses the four, the four words about prayer. He urges us, he says, first of all, that requests, that's the word supplication, that's supplication, prayers, adoration, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in author, author, authority. So, so the word is used there. Intercession is simply praying on behalf of others. And again, we see this in the Lord, the Lord Jesus in Hebrews chapter 7. Um, we read that he, uh, he is able to save, save completely. Hebrews 7 verse 25, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to make or to intercede, to make intercession for them. So he is constantly interceding for us. I, I think of that beautiful passage in Luke chapter 22, where just before um, the crucifixion and Peter's denial of Jesus, um, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. That's intercession, praying for others. And as I said, that's not found here in Philippians 4, verse 6. And the fourth thing is the word appreciation. And again, we see that here 
in verse um, in verse six because it says, "Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving." There's the appreciation. Present your requests to God. So appreciation is just simply giving thanks, thanking God for answers to prayer, but it's even thanking God in advance for the answers to prayer that he will give to us. It's thanking God for the privilege of being able to present our petitions, our supplications uh, before, before him. Now, look at verse 6 again, and I want you to notice the thrust. It says here, do not be anxious about anything underscore that. That's key. Anything. Don't worry about anything. That includes everything, right? But in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We can bring everything to God. Don't worry about it. Anything, bring everything to God. So here we're encouraged to take everything to God. I suppose if there's any failure that I've had in my life in terms of prayer, um, biggest struggle is just doing prayer, praying. But if there's a secondary struggle that I've had, it is that um, I tend to bring the big things to God. And the little things I don't. That's part of the confession that I'm making today. That may be true of you too. Others of us may bring all the little things to God and we don't bring the big things to God. But I tend to worry about the little things, but the big things, I kind of think God's got it. That's me. This passage is saying that talking to God about everything that concerns us is the first step to victory over worry. You've got to bring it all to God. Whatever troubles you, whatever concerns you, you bring it all to God. So let me get into this confession a bit today. Last night as I was reading and preparing for this this morning, um, something hit me very, very hard. And uh, it kind of started on Tuesday on Tuesday, I was in a Zoom call, um, a prayer time, just at the start, uh, the prayer time that Sharon Weir has uh, with a number of individuals who are meeting each week to pray for revival. And um, I just got on at the beginning of the Zoom chat to share some prayer concerns. And uh, Dorette James asked me, uh, before I got off, she said, Pastor, please tell us how you are. Now, she wasn't asking the way we normally ask each other when we see each other, hi, how are you? She really wanted to know how I was doing. So as best as I was able, I responded and, and shared with her uh, how I was feeling, the struggles I was having. Uh, I appreciated her asking me so that I could really let her and the others who were on the Zoom chat know. I talked about things like it's been stressful during this COVID-19 time uh, in terms of the delivery of ministry. Uh, it's been frustrating as well. Uh, I talked about the, uh, the, dif the, dif the difficulty that I experience in, in speaking to a camera all the time and not to real people. Um, and I said that, to be frank, I'm, I'm just Zoomed out. On Tuesday, I was involved in five different Zoom calls. And uh, Tuesday night, I just, around eight, I got home and I was zoomed out. So I, I talked about those those things. But then as I was reading, and this author said that um, that worry can lead to neck pains and back and back pains, I just I immediately thought about what I was experiencing in my in my body. And I have put down, I have a, a real tension here in my my right shoulder and and I've been I've been putting it down to the fact that I use my right arm to move the mouse around and most of what I do on the computer is with my right hand and so I'm constantly lifting my 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 arm and I put it down solely to that I just thought you know if I massage it enough that'll go away it's just bad habits using the mouse on a computer and it just hit me really hard that that's not really what it was that there have been little things, I suppose, that I have really been worrying about, not, not the bigger things. I seem to be able to handle that. It hit me all of a sudden that what I've been doing in prayer in recent days is I've been interceding on behalf of others 
but I've not really been supplicating on behalf of myself. And I don't, I don't say that in any kind of a, wow, you know, look at me, I'm interceding, I'm more concerned about others. I don't mean it in that sense. It's just, it's just kind of the way I'm wired. And it hit me hard that I, I, need, I need to start supplicating. I need to start bringing the things that really bother me and concern me and that I'm worried about to God. And uh, just so that you know, on a personal level, what's been really um, getting to me is the lack of freedom for me to just kind of go out and do some things that I want to do. And the big thing for me is back in November, we have a little cottage at a Christian camp campground. And um, back in November, two massive uh, ash trees came down when there was some real severe wind, just missing the deck that we had built. But this was a huge ash tree. And the, the carnage, as it were, on the lawn is phenomenal. I thought I was going to lose three trees, but the arborist we brought in saved the other, the other tree. But I have down on the ground now this massive tree, and I've got to get down there to this camp to cut this thing up. I don't want to do that this summer. Uh, I want to get it done now. And I had arranged six months ago for four individuals, two of them from our church, and the other two, my sons, to come in on not this weekend, but the coming weekend to, to get her done and to really work on that. And now there's this prohibition. I can't go down there. The camp is closed. They won't open the camp, yada, yada, yada. And that's been bothering me. And I've, I don't think I've surrendered that to God. And so uh, th there's been this hope of getting this done and the fear that I can't get it done. And it's been strangling me and pulling me in different directions. And so last night I started to supplicate about something simple, personal, but it's been getting to me. Here's the point. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, you need to supplicate, not just intercede. Do that, yes, but you need to supplicate. You need to bring everything in your heart every concern to the Lord. And what happens when we supplicate with appreciation, with thanksgiving? Well, it's right here in this, in this passage. And the peace of God, verse seven, which transcends all understanding. You, you can't put this in words. We'll guard. The word there, guard, means garrison. It's like a fortress. Garrison your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, of course, it all comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So think of Paul here. Paul is writing these words and he's guarded. He's garrisoned in this jail. He's literally chained to a Roman guard. And Paul is saying that God's peace can do the same thing for us. It can stand guard on our behalf. And God's peace stands guard over two areas that create worry. Look at what it says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, number one, your hearts, your feelings, and number two, your minds, your thinking, in Christ Jesus. So the peace of God doesn't mean the absence of trials, but it does mean that in the midst of those trials and frustrations and concerns and worries, we have perfect peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, because the Lord is with us. Let me just close with this. In Daniel chapter 6, read it today. Amazing passage. In Daniel 6, Daniel, uh, because of his good life, is rising to important levels within the Babylonian kingdom where he was taken in exile as a slave. And uh, the king um, is very pleased with him, but there's a, there's a lot of jealousy going on between among all the other officials to the king, and they don't really appreciate Daniel and his faith. They can't find any fault with him. And so they know they, they can find some fault with him if they go after his God and his faith. And so they ask the king to establish a decree that, that all prayers must go to the king and to no other God. And that if anyone prays to a God other than the king, um, those individuals would be put to death or punished. 
It's really a setup. They're trying to catch Daniel in some kind of a fault because they're jealous of him. And so this decree is issued by the king and Daniel, of course, refuses to obey it. And the scripture tells us in Daniel 6 that Daniel goes to his, his room, to his chamber, and uh, he prays. And in, in verse 10, it says that he prayed and gave thanks. Now, those two words are the words adoration and appreciation. The two parts to prayer. Two parts to prayer. But in verse 11, it says that he brought his petitions and he pleaded with God. He supplicated. He supplicated. So he had all three of these components in his prayer. And the interesting thing about the story is you remember these guys go back and snitch to the king about Daniel disobeying uh, the king's decree. And so the king has to put Daniel into the lion's den. And they lower Daniel into the lion's den. The king doesn't want to do it, but he lowers him into the lion's den. And the story tells us in Daniel 6 that Daniel slept the whole night in a lion's den because the angel of the Lord had come to him to res rescue him. But the funny thing is, is that the king who put him there, he couldn't sleep. He was up all night worrying. And so just a beautiful, beautiful story that tells us a true story that Daniel practiced Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He brought his request to God. He made his supplication to God. He prayed. He adored God. He worshiped God. He brought his supplication to God. He brought his petitions to God. And he did so with thanksgiving. And the result was he had the peace of God in a lion's den. And God can do the same for us. Amen. God and Father, we just thank you for this this beautiful truth here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Lord, there, we love all of your word. We love every word that comes from you. It's all given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, there are parts of your word that we really love, parts of your word that really touch us deeply and meet our need. And this is one of those passages. Lord, this, these two verses are a promise, not only a command, but a promise. And so, Lord, help us to supplicate and to bring all that troubles us before you. And as we do, lift from our burden, from our shoulders, the burdens we feel and grant us your perfect peace that surpasses all comprehension because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining me today. Uh, don't forget, tomorrow is COVID Blessings. And uh, if you are going to share with us how God has blessed you during this period of time, uh, make sure you email that to us uh, within the next couple of hours. God bless. Have a great day. Bye-bye.